A reading from the book of Exodus. As Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the commandments in his hands, he did not know that the skin of his face had become radiant while he conversed with the Lord. When Aaron then and the other children of Israel saw Moses and noticed how radiant the skin of his face had become, they were afraid to come near him. Only after Moses called to them did Aaron and all the rulers of the community come back to him. Moses then spoke to them. Later on, all the children of Israel came up to him, and he enjoined on them all that the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. When he finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses entered the presence of the Lord to converse with him, he removed the veil until he came out again. On coming out, he would tell the children of Israel all that had been commanded. Then the children of Israel would see that the skin of Moses' face was radiant. So he would again put the veil over his face until he went in to converse with the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm is, Holy is the Lord our God. Holy is the Lord our God. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Holy is the Lord our God. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Holy is the Lord our God. From the pillar of cloud he spoke to them. They heard his decrees and the law that he gave them. Holy is the Lord our God. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For holy is the Lord our God. Holy is the Lord our God. friends, says the Lord, for I have made known to you all that the Father has told me. The Lord be with you. And with the Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. <clears throat> Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field which a person finds and hides again, and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In case you are unaware, I am currently living the fifth week. Does anybody know what the fifth week is? I am currently living the fifth week. So in case you do not know, because some of you look like you're shaking your head, and some of you are not shaking your head, which means you may not know. The spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. That 30 day retreat experience is made up of four weeks. And they always refer to the fifth week as to how you live your life after the four week experience. Now, I just finished my eight day retreat, which is a slimmed down version of the 30 day spiritual exercises. And we do this every year. And I finished my eight day retreat on Sunday. So I am now living the fifth week. Normally, the weeks of the exercises really, they're not necessarily seven days. Depends on how many meditations or contemplations or the strength of those contemplations and meditations. So instead of one week lasting seven days, it could last eight, it could last you know, six, it all depends. And when you do an eight day retreat, which is a slim down version and you still go through the meditations of the four weeks, you know, that one week can be done in a day or a day and a half. But for me, 
every single year, without exception, my fifth week lasts for 357 days. Fifth week of the spiritual exercises, 357 days. Because in 357 days, or technically 352 days, I will be once again beginning my spiritual exercises for eight days, and then living the fifth week after that. So members of the agrupacion who are encouraged, so as to not say are obliged, but who are encouraged to do the spiritual exercises every year, normally a three or four day retreat, your fifth week should last 362 days, 363 days, right? So I'm living the fifth week overjoyed after spending eight days in silence with the Lord. I confess that my ADD normally on the sixth day I'm, I'm bouncing off the walls, but I, I, I can do it. And after eight days of being in silence and in prayer, the intensity of the contemplation and being able to walk with Christ during that retreat experience, I'm telling you that I feel like the first reading. Moses with the shiny face. And shiny faces is not difficult for me because I have a natural glow, as you can tell. But I feel like Moses, that people see me and they say, oh, there's, there's something different about you. Have you lost weight? Yes, I have lost weight, but it's not that. It's that I just got off an eight-day retreat and I feel very much the presence of God inside of me. I have to be very careful because when you spend eight days in a silent retreat and you go back into the noise and the hustle and bustle of regular life in Miami, you have a tendency of being a bit more impatient. It didn't help that I made the mistake that when I got in my car leaving the retreat house and headed home, I turned on the radio and they were playing Staying Alive by the Bee Gees and it kind of like threw me off my retreat. So I turned it off very quickly. But I realized that I have to ease into the experience of living the graces of those eight days in ordinary <coughs> life, in everyday life. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I experienced on this retreat, and there were many things. But how powerful is the presence of God? How powerful those spiritual exercises are? We had a retreat director, a priest, who is currently the superior of the Jesuits in Cuba. He is a priest from the Dominican Republic. His name is Father David Pantaleo, and he came to give the retreat. We had actually originally invited the provincial of Venezuela, but because of the situation in the country and the inability to get the visa, he wasn't able to come. David Pantaleo came from Cuba, and whoever would have thought that it's easier to come from Cuba to Miami than it is from Venezuela, but that's the, case, that's the situation we're living in now. David Pantaleo came from Cuba to give us the retreat. Now, I will confess to you that I was a little concerned about this retreat because the first night when he came to give the first point of the retreat, he walked into the room with a guitar. Now, I got a little nervous because I have a tendency of you know, be a bit more traditional when it comes to giving the exercises. So when I saw him walking in with the guitar, I said, oh, you're gonna have a problem again. <laughs> but he came in with his guitar. And the fact is that Father David is a musician. He spends a good number of his, you know, good part of his life writing music and singing music. And he's very good at it. And he decided that he was going to incorporate the singing into giving of the points. Now, here's where the evil spirit began. I hadn't even started the retreat, and already the evil spirit was saying, oh, to us a little bit be a little It's not gonna work. And I had to hold myself off. I said, no, no, but that's open to the spirit. And at the end of the day, even if I don't like the singing, I've been doing the spiritual exercises for 25 years, so I could, you know, basically go on my own. I could do autopilot, no problem with that. And Father David Pantereo sang his songs throughout the retreat. And some were good. And some weren't that good, and some helped, and some didn't help. But no matter what the style, no matter who gave it, no matter whether there was singing or no singing, whether the presentation was 45 minutes or whether it was 10 minutes, the grace of those days of spiritual exercises is unquestionably there. And I think that the, 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 the beauty of St. Ignatius of Loyola is that he was convinced that what he had received was this treasure this pearl of great value. 
and that he needed to give that to the church, and he did. And that the extraordinary thing about that treasure, the extraordinary thing about that pearl, is not the person who has it, not the person who owns the land or owns the pearl in the first place. The extraordinary thing about that treasure, the extraordinary thing is the treasure or the pearl itself. And so the person who owns that land and the person who owns the pearl, he can sing guitar, he can rap, he can do whatever he wants. But it's the treasure, it's the pearl of great price, which is so significant. And the grace of God abounds in that experience given to us by our Father Ignatius, whose feast day, as you know, we celebrated on Monday. I confess that of all the contemplations that I did, the most powerful one was contemplation, which many of you have done, called the call of the earthly king. And I've done this contemplation many, many times. But for some reason this year, that contemplation really struck a chord with me. And I'll tell you why. It's because of a different perspective the Lord gave me on this retreat. See, if you remember the spiritual exercise, the Saint Ignatius of Loyola tells you this. He says, imagine this huge field filled with people. And standing at the front of this crowd is a king. So you imagine this majestic figure with armor and a helmet under his left arm and a sword stuck into the ground, holding the hilt with his right. And this great majestic king standing in front of this crowd begins to tell the people who are gathered here, I am calling you to serve with me in this great army and to take on this great cause. And I assure you, says this great king, that if you fight when I fight, if you keep watch when I keep watch, if you eat when I eat and sleep when I sleep, I assure you that when we are victorious, and, and we will be victorious, you will share with me in the glory. In a nutshell, that's the meditation. You remember it, right? That contemplation? So then Ignatius says, what knight, what soldier, what subject would not listen to this king and not say, yes, I will serve? Then, he says, now imagine this same field, basically. But now it's not a majestic king. Now it's, it's Jesus. Jesus is standing there. And there's a crowd, and Jesus begins to speak. I am calling all of you to serve with me. There's a form, he says, with me. And if you keep watch when I keep watch, and if you eat when I eat and sleep when I sleep, I assure you that when we are victorious, and we shall be victorious, you will share with me in the victory. And so Ignatius says, well, what subject of our Lord would not say yes to him? So that's a great contemplation, but I'll tell you where the difference was this year. See, every year I imagine that contemplation of me standing in the presence of thousands of individuals, some that I recognize and some that I don't recognize at all, but we're all there. And Jesus begins to speak to the crowd. The big difference is that this year, I was the only one there. I don't know how I came about with this image, but I'm standing in this field and I am by myself with the Lord. And Jesus walks right up to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says to me, Willie, I want you to come join me. I want you to fight when I fight. I want you to serve when I serve. I want you to sleep when I sleep and eat when I eat. Keep watch with me when I keep watch. And I promise you, Willie, that if you follow me, I promise you that one day you will share the glory with me. And all of a sudden, it wasn't about thousands of people who in unison decided to follow Christ. Now it was I who had to make the choice. Am I, without taking into consideration what thousands of people may say, am I willing to serve the Lord? Now the thing is that Ignatius is 
so wise. The experience was so profound and so much part of the Holy Spirit that Ignatius very wisely puts this contemplation right at the end of the first week of the spiritual exercises. Now, if you don't know the first week of the spiritual exercises, you have, you're supposed to meditate on your sin. And after you start thinking about all the sins and all the offenses that you have made throughout the year, your recurring sin, you're supposed to remember that Jesus Christ, out of profound and unconditional love, died for you and for those sins. So imagine, my brothers, after having prayed about my sin, after having experienced the unconditional love of Jesus Christ who forgives every single one, no matter what they are, no matter how often they have it, how do you say no to him? Saying no to Jesus would mean that you are ungrateful, that you truly haven't experienced that his love, which is there. But if you are grateful, if there is gratitude in your heart, and if you truly have encountered the person of Jesus Christ, then you say yes to Christ. You say yes. This is a way of reconfirming my vocation. This is a way of reconfirming our vocation. Our vocation as men who belong to a church for 2,000 years has struggled and striven to serve Jesus Christ the vast majority of the time extraordinarily well and on occasions poorly. But as faithful and holy soldiers we get up and we fight. But each and every single one of us, without exception, nadie se libera de esta. Each and every single one of us, as an individual, as a man, has to say yes. You know, it's kind of like on Sunday Mass, when you stand after the homily to profess the faith, and when you're standing in a church filled with 300 people, and they begin the profession of faith, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, you say the profession of faith without skipping a beat, following the voices of 300 other individuals. But the moment that you have to stand by yourself and say that same, pray that same profession of faith with nobody else around, how many of us can get through it without the help of 299 other voices? Do we forget some parts? Do we stumble with some of the words? Do we all of a sudden go back to the old creed that we remember better than the new creed? But at the end of the day, the reason why that creed was changed, and I don't know if you know this, but one of the reasons why that creed was changed is because before the recent changes, the profession of faith said, we believe in one God. And Pope Benedict XVI very wisely in those liturgical changes says, now you have to say, I believe in one God. Because while you are a member of a church, one billion strong around the world, you have to profess, I have to profess, that I believe in one God, the Father the Almighty. So, we come to Mass for the opportunity to be able to approach the Lord, that same great key. And I ask you that today, as you approach the Lord, as you approach this extraordinary treasure, which is Jesus Christ, as you approach this extra extraordinary pearl of great price, as you come into communion with Jesus, give him your unconditional yes. Tell him that you're willing to serve, to fight, to sleep when he sleeps and eat when he eats, because you want to share with the glory. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.